Okay, welcome back, Dr. Lindy here. So in a previous video, we started talking about the four different types of tissue, epithelium, connective, muscle, and nerve. In the last video, we talked about epithelial tissue. But in the very beginning of that video, I contrasted the difference between epithelial tissue and connective tissue. And one of the big differences is if you look at the very first sentence here, it says connective tissue consists of widely spaced cells that are separated by matrix, or you heard me use the word extracellular matrix. And you'll see this abbreviation throughout your textbooks, ECM, extracellular matrix. So when you have cells that are far apart from one another and have lots of matrix or ground substance between the cells, that's connective tissue. Epithelium is just like stratified squamous, you have multiple layers of cells packed closely together with little extracellular matrix. Connective tissue is the most abundant and variable tissue type that's found in all parts of the body. Its primary function by the term connective, it's going to connect organs to each other. It even connects to the, it connects the epithelium to the rest of the body. It gives support and protection, physical protection and immune protection. How does it give us immune protection? Well, blood, blood is connective tissue. It's just referred to as liquid connective tissue. And the type of blood that gives us immune protection, we call them white blood cells, right? WBCs, white blood cells. The lymphocytes have two flavors, and I don't know if I went into the two flavors of lymphocytes, but they're T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. And the B lymphocytes help us produce antibodies. That's part of our immune support, okay? The storage, when we talk about storage of energy, well, we have fat cells and fat cells are called adipose or adipocytes. And you have this fat cell and sometimes students confuse a fat cell with a squamous cell because they're kind of like roundish and irregular shaped, but a squamous cell has a nucleus in the center and a fat cell looks like this and its nucleus is at the periphery of the membrane. So adipose or fat cells can store sugar and the body uses sugar for energy. We just call that type of cell triglycerides. When you have a fat cell with sugar in it, we call it triglycerides. So um, adipose is also an insulator. It's involved with heat production, an insulator. And we know that connective tissue is involved with the movement and transport of materials through the body, especially within our blood vessels through blood. Okay, so let's look at how uh, connective tissue can be categorized. Let's take a look. So one category is called connective tissue proper. And under connective tissue proper, we have loose connective tissue and we have dense connective tissue. All right, so I just want you to see the categories first. So Connective tissue proper, we have loose connective tissue, and there are three under that category. And then there's dense connective tissue, and we have three under that category. Then we have fluid connective tissue that you heard me mention before, and we have blood and lymph that fall under that. Then we have a third category, which is called supporting connective tissue. And under supporting connective tissue, this is where we talk about cartilage. This is where we talk about bone, bone and cartilage. This is supporting connective tissue. And this is why we talked about the osteon and bone and all of its different components. 
Then we have uh, muscle tissue and nerve tissue. So we're stopping here at connective tissue. So let's review the main categories once again. We have connective tissue proper. There's loose and dense connective tissue under that. There's fluid connective tissue. And then we have supporting connective tissue. Those are the biggies. So let's go back to loose connective tissue. And in this part of the lecture, we're gonna introduce the terms and then I will show you what they look like under a microscope slide. We'll go over these, okay? So loose connective tissue is gonna provide padding for the body and it's gonna separate your skin from the deeper tissues. So when you pinch your forearm and your skin can separate from the muscle that lies deeper, that's areolar connective tissue. And it has some protein fibers in it, elastin and collagen fibers. The term elastic it sounds like the word, it gives it its elasticity. And collagen gives it its firmness and strength. Collagen is another type of protein that really gives structures more strength and stability, whereas elastin or elastic proteins give it more flexibility, if you would. Okay, under loose connective tissue, we have adipose, and those are fat cells. And you saw me draw a fat cell before that has a nucleus that's off to the side, it's at the periphery. Now, fat cells are really interesting because fat cells um, can increase in number prior to puberty, right? So managing one's body composition, like their amount of lean mass to fat mass is really important, especially up until the time of puberty where the numbers of fat cells don't increase much after puberty, but the size of what's already there can increase or decrease. So fat cells can hypertrophy, meaning they get larger, or they atrophy and get smaller. Now you can try and trick the system and go for liposuction, and liposuction lipids can pull out some of the fat cells. But what people need to understand is that fat cells come from a stem cell called a mesenchymal cell and mesenchymal cells can evolve into more fat cells if the body calls for it. Now, fat cells are really important for us because they store toxins. They store toxins for us. So when your body is invaded by toxins, and that could be toxins in the air, toxins in food, toxins in medications and drugs, the body's going, hey, this is not a carbohydrate, a protein, or a fat. And if it's not seen as a protein, carbohydrate, or a fat, it's going to say, this is a toxin, we got to get rid of it. And hey, Mr. or Mrs. Liver, we need your help. So it puts it in a fat cell. Otherwise, your it would damage your neurology. And then the fat cell stores it and little by little, it leaches out the toxin at a pace that hopefully your liver can tolerate. If your liver can't tolerate the toxins at the pace that they're coming in, this is when people get really, really sick. So having good liver support is truly super important to helping the body quench these free radicals. And I hear from my patients all the time, oh, I'm doing a liver cleanse, I'm do doing a detox. And I think they're very dangerous to do without the supervision of someone who's knowledgeable about what nutrients the liver needs and what antioxidants the body needs to do a proper detox. When you do a detox, the detoxification process is more dangerous than the input of the toxins to the body. Hopefully that message gets across. When the body breaks down the toxins, that could be more damaging than the original time the toxins were introduced. And free radicals and um, what's called reactive oxygen species or ROS is trying to damage your DNA. And when you have reactive 
oxygen species, we need antioxidants to quench the oxidative stress. And if you have more oxidants in the body, which are bullets going off in the body, then antioxidants, which would be the bulletproof vest, there's a problem. All right. So I'm very much against people in the general public doing a detox without the proper supervision. Sometimes the damage from the detox is really harmful. So it's better to know what nutrients the liver needs ahead of time, what amino acids and what antioxidants are needed to do it properly. Okay, uh, reticular loose connective tissue is really the framework of what many organs are made up of. And we'll show you what that looks like under a microscope. Dense connective tissue, so that's loose connective tissue. It has much more of a loose, irregular appearance than dense. So when we look at loose, we may see fibers like this. We may see some cells here and here, and then we see other fibers going this way and this way. It looks very loose compared to dense, where we have protein fibers running very close to one another in these parallel forms. So it gives it a much more dense, packed type of appearance we'll find dense regular connective tissue with tendons and ligaments. And that's due to these collagen fibers being more densely packed to one another. Dense irregular connective tissue, we'll see this in the skin, especially in the dermis, not the epidermis, but the dermis. And that's because you may have some cells like this, another one further away this way, another one in this direction. They may not be perfectly parallel. And this is important because think about being massaged, right? If you get your massage, your skin is not manipulated in a linear fashion in one direction. It could be manipulated in circles, diagonals, up, round, left, right. And that's because the direction of these fibers are not perfectly parallel so they don't rip and tear very easily. So we wanna have dense irregular connective tissue, which is different than dense regular connective tissue within the skin. Elastic connective tissue, we're gonna see this with certain ligaments that need more elasticity. If we look at the vertebral column, which is made up of 24 freely movable vertebrae, I, in my 25, 26 years of practice, have never seen an individual come in with a dislocated vertebral segment. I see subtle misalignments here and there, but nothing where Is he frozen for anyone else or just me? Yeah, he's gone. No, yeah. Okay. I thought I was geeking too. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was me. Yeah, no, he froze. I think he left the meeting. Sure. I think we just got a weed on him. <laughs> Yo, do you have a class group chat for this class or not? Yeah, there's a group me. We're back on? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Where did I lose you? What was the last thing you heard? <laughs> All I know is it shut down. I don't know if there's a storm or something. We're what was the... About, like, um, fracture or dislocation or something? Okay. Did I talk about the... Um... Okay. I know exactly where we are. Yes. Okay. Let me go back. Let me do the screen share. Okay, if you could just meet yourselves again, I appreciate it.
Okay, we're still recording. Thank goodness we're still on. So one of the last things I believe you heard me talking about was that in all of my years, I've never seen a uh, dislocated vertebrae. I've seen a fractured one, many fractured or compressed vertebrae. In fact, I had a gentleman come in three weeks ago who fell from an attic. And when he fell from, this was three months ago. When he fell from an attic, he landed on his tush and for three months, he's been in a lot of pain. Now he's never went, believe it, I, I saw him for the first time last week. He's never went for an x-ray, never went for an MRI. And as soon as I examined him, I found a very, very sensitive vertebral segment. And um, the way that his posture was, and based on my palpation skills, I knew that he had a compression fracture. So I sent him to a local radiologist, probably the most prominent on Long Island. I don't want to mention the name, but the mo one of the most prominent on Long Island. And the report came back normal. And I said, this can't possibly be. There's no way. There's no way. Based on the history and based on my exam, there's no way that there's no fracture. So this is why it's important not just to trust another physician's interpretation of x-rays and MRIs, but to have a second set of eyes look at those films. As soon as I saw the x-rays, I saw the compression fracture there. It was at T12. So I called up the radiologist again. I left a message and I said, could you please take a second look at these films? It appears to be a compression fracture due to the axial load meaning the up and down compressive force on his spine, it literally compressed and fractured. So immediately I received a phone call back, Dr. Lindner, good set of eyes. There is a compression fracture that's there. And we sent them for an MRI to confirm it. And thank goodness, remember this happened three months ago. This wasn't recent. So he's been walking around working in HVAC for three months with a healing fracture. Super dangerous, but thank goodness it was stable. So the point to the story is that even with that type of trauma, it's rare to find a vertebrae that will dislocate completely. They can fracture and they can slightly misalign. Because the 24, verte uh, for 24 vertebral segments, seven in the neck, 12 in the mid back and five in the lumbar spine, are so flexible. You think of how a spine can move. You think of people doing yoga and how flexible they can be. Gymnastics, yoga, it's important for the spine to have ligaments. Ligaments go from bone to bone, but it's important for them to have a balance between collagen for strength and stability and elastin for flexibility. The ligaments of the spine have much more elastic connective tissue than they do collagen. But other joints, let's say the knee joint, which is the largest joint in the body, its bony support is very, very poor. The ligaments of the knee joint have to have more collagen for strength and some elastic for its flexibility. So the spine needs more elastic compared to collagen, whereas the knee needs more collagen in relationship to elastic when it comes to ligaments. Remember ligaments go from one bone to another bone and tendons are an extension of muscle that go from muscle to bone. They're different. Tendons have a better blood supply than do ligaments. When a tendon is stretched beyond its anatomical limit, we call that a strain with a T, a strain. When a ligament is stretched beyond its anatomical limit, we call it a sprain with a P, sprain, okay? Strains with a T can heal faster than sprains with a P. Strains can heal better. Muscles and tendons can heal faster than ligaments and even cartilage due to um, muscles and tendons having a better blood supply. Okay, let's look at fluid connective tissue. 
So this should be review. In another lecture, we talked about blood. We said you have RBCs, which are red blood cells. These are erythrocytes. Then we have WBCs, which are white blood cells, and these are leukocytes. Remember on exams, do not abbreviate. You can't abbreviate on your lab exams. So if you see a red blood cell, you would write erythrocyte or red blood cell. Don't go RBC. Um, on, an, on a cell, if you see uh, a rough endoplasmic reticulum, you have to write rough endoplasmic reticulum, not rough ER. You can't abbreviate. Okay. Okay. Um, the WBCs help fight infection. The RBCs carry blood gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide. Platelets help us to clot. They help us to uh, create a plug or a thrombosis that allows bleeding to stop. Those are platelets. Lymph. Lymph is another type of liquid. It is the interstitial fluid that's found between the cells. Remember, if here's a cell, and here's a cell, and here's a cell, the fluid that is between the cells, that's called extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid found between the cells of the human body that enters your lymphatic vessels to be cleansed and purified and recycled and returned back into circulation. So blood and lymph are fluid connective tissue. Now supporting connective tissue, cartilage. And cartilage comes in a few flavors. We have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibro cartilage. Cartilage is avascular. When you put this A in front of the word, right, vascular means blood vessel. When you put the, the letter A in front of it, it means without. So cartilage is without blood supply. And because cartilage is without blood supply, it makes cartilage regeneration and repair much more difficult. It can repair, it just takes a lot more time because it's not delivering you know, oxygen and blood and nutrients at a very fast pace. So it takes more time. The most common type of cartilage that we're gonna see in the body is called hyaline cartilage. And this is what we find covering the end of the bones. And where two bones come together and meet, that articulation is called a joint. So where your elbow, where your radius bone meets your humerus, that's the elbow joint. Where the humerus meets the scapula, that's the shoulder joint. Where two bones come together to form a freely movable joint, we call that a diarthrosis, a freely movable joint. At the very ends of the bone, it's lined with hyaline cartilage. And when hyaline cartilage degenerates, we call it arthritis, or we call it degenerative joint disease, which is the same thing as calling it osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is the same thing as degenerative joint disease. It's not the same thing as rheumatoid arthritis. They are not interchangeable terms. Degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis is really like a wear and tear arthritis from um, doing by putting abnormal forces on healthy joints, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition where the body is attacking its own cartilage and breaking it down. Symptoms may be the same. Cell destruction, it's just cause is very different. RA is autoimmune. Degenerative joint disease, aka osteoarthritis, is not autoimmune. So when the cartilage 
starts to break down that hyaline cartilage, we call it degenerative joint disease. And the cartilage cells need to regenerate and repair. When cartilage cells regenerate and repair, that's good. When they degenerate and don't repair, it's bad. So it's movement of the joint that's really important to help the synovial fluid circulate to help regenerate those cartilage cells. So how does someone with DJD that's in pain, how are they gonna move their joints to circulate the fluid to regenerate the cartilage cells to build up? This is where aquatic therapy comes into play, right? When you can remove the force of gravity and make movement and exercise more comfortable for people, that's where a pool or aquatic therapy comes into play because you're eliminating that variable of gravity. So just swimming and moving the arms and legs and pedaling in a water creates movement. Very, very important for people. Okay, uh, elastic cartilage, this allows for flexibility. So the cartilage in the ear, the cartilage in the nose, uh, the cartilage in the eustachian tube in the ear, the, um, what else? The ligaments around the lungs and ligaments around the spinal column. Things where we need more flexibility are gonna have elastic cartilage. Now, fibrocartilage, this is the strongest cartilage that we have in the body. It's a shock absorber. Where do we have shock absorbers throughout the body? Between the vertebral segments, between each vertebrae, we call them intervertebral discs, discs. Or sometimes you'll see this abbreviation IVD, which is intervertebral discs, okay? That gentleman that fell from the attic that was doing HVAC work, uh, he had, where he had the compression fracture, he had a herniated disc and an L4, L5, and L5 and sacrum herniated discs, okay? All right, so those are the three types of cartilage. We spoke about bone in an earlier lecture, but let's review that the outer part of the bone is the periosteum. And in the periosteum, we have osteoblasts. And what do osteoblasts do? Osteoblasts are the bones that are going to produce matrix. They are immature cells, but they do form the extracellular matrix and osteoblasts evolve into an osteocyte. The osteocyte is gonna maintain bone. That's a mature cell. Remember the osteoblast is producing the extracellular matrix, all those calcium salts. And when it does, and those calcium salts ossify or calcify, the osteoblast gets trapped in its lacunae. And now it becomes known as an osteocyte. The osteoclasts are dissolving the matrix. So this is gonna break bone down. So the osteoblast with a B builds up bone and the osteoclast with a C breaks down bone. Remember the osteon is that functional unit of compact bone. It's gonna have all of those concentric lamellae and in the very center, it's gonna have the central canal that's gonna contain the artery, the vein, the nerve and the blood vessel. I'll show you the concentric lamellae and the circumferential again, as well as the interstitial lamellae. The canaliculi are those finger-like extensions that come off of the osteocyte, those small little channels that radiate out. And the Volkmann's canal or the Habersian canal is what we see at the very center where we have the artery, the vein, the nerve, the lymphatics go right through the center of it. All right, the outside of the bone was the periosteum whereas the inside of the bone is the endosteum. The endosteum is going to cover the spongy bone, not the compact bone, the spongy bone, okay? 
So when we look at this picture here, here's a long bone. And at the end of the bone here, and at the end of the bone here, this is where we're gonna have hyaline cartilage. It's just gonna line that, the ends of long bones. We're gonna find the hyaline cartilage. Right here in the center is the Haversian canal or the central canal. This section right here is compact bone, right? So all of this here, this is all compact. And that's where we see these osteons, right? This entire thing right here, this is an osteon that's made up of these concentric lamellae. And you could see in the central canal or the Persian canal, artery, vein, and nerve. The interstitial lamellae, the interstitial lamellae are here, right? That's the remnants of old osteons. They are the lamellae that's found between each osteon. Okay. Here is spongy bone in the center. They call this trabecula or spongy bone. And near the spongy bone is where we see the periosteum, whereas the periosteum is the outside of the bone, the endosteum is the inner part of the bone. So endosteum is where the spongy bone is and the periosteum is near the uh, compact bone. The periosteum, this is where muscles attach to the periosteum by way of tendons. So tendons attach to the periosteum. I'll put a T there for tendons as do ligaments, okay? And then here is the, one of the bone models that we looked at just to review, uh, here is, let's look at number two down here at the bottom. Two is our compact bone. When we look at number one, that's our spongy bone. Number three is our periosteum. That's the outer part of the bone right here. And the endosteum is number 13 which is here. Okay. Here's the bone marrow found near spongy bone, 14, that's bone marrow. Let's look at number six, which is the osteon. Number six, right here, this entire structure. This is one osteon. Let's look at number seven, where we have concentric lamellae. Each of those rings going around is a concentric lamellae. Number eight is an osteocyte, a little hard uh, to see. So I won't be, at, oh, it's a little hard to see here because how do you know that I'm not pointing to the lacuna, right? So if it asks for what is the cavity, it's the lacuna, but what's the name of the cell? That would be the osteocyte. Number nine is the central canal, that's here, also known as the Haversian canal. And those are the main structures that you should know. Uh, where's number 10? Here's number 10, the interstitial lamellae. Again, those are remnants of old osteons. Connective tissue is highly vascular with the exceptions of cartilage, tendons, and ligaments. And in order, I would say tendons are the, have a better blood supply. Second place would be ligaments. And then third place, the worst would be uh, cartilage. They tend to be very, very um, avascular, okay? Okay, I will take a break here. When I come back, we will talk about the three types of muscle.